Welcome back to another Vulcan Game Engine tutorial. Some viewers whose devices support the Mailbox Present mode may have already run into the problem where their animations run very quickly. My computer does not support this present mode, but if I uncomment these lines to run using the immediate mode, you can see what I mean. We need to implement some sort of timing mechanism in our loop. One way that we already know how to do this is by synchronizing with the display's vertical sync by using the FIFO present mode. But one big issue with this approach would be that the game would run faster on displays with higher refresh rates. For example, the cube would spin twice as fast when played on a 120Hz monitor compared to a 60Hz monitor. Game loop timing is a surprisingly complex topic, and it is a pretty unique problem to the domain of making games. Not many other applications require user interaction in real time while also simulating multiple different subsystems such as AI, physics, audio, rendering, and more. In this tutorial, I will present a very simple solution that will work well for now, but is really just the tip of the iceberg. There are many ways to make a bad game loop. So I recommend taking a look at the articles Game Loop Timing and Fix Your Time Step. Links are in the description below. Also, Game Engine Architecture by Jason Gregory has an entire chapter dedicated to just this topic. The basic idea behind a game engine is that it consists of various systems, with each system being capable of advancing by a certain amount of time. The amount of time we advance the system by is called the time step. It is also commonly referred to as delta time, or DT for short, as it is the difference between the current time and the time the system last ran. If we make it so that each system can take a variable size time step, then we can render the game at as high a frame rate as our computer can achieve without issue. For high frame rates, we essentially are just taking more frequent and small time steps rather than a few large ones. Okay, let's get to coding. First thing we're going to do is include the chrono header in the app implementation file. Chrono is a date and time library that we can use to get a very precise reading of the current system time with high precision. Now to add some timing capabilities to the game loop. Inside the run function, just above the while loop, declare auto current time is equal to std chrono high resolution clock now. This returns a high precision value representing the current time. Then inside the while loop, we get the amount of time that has elapsed per iteration of the loop. So declare auto new time is equal to std chrono high resolution clock now. And we can just copy and paste this from just above. We declare this after the glfw poll events function call because the function call may block. For example, while resizing, the whole program pauses, and we need the amount of time elapsed to be accurate. Next, I will calculate the amount of seconds elapsed with float frame time is equal to std chrono duration with float comma std chrono second period in angle brackets and then new time minus current time as the argument. And then all of this followed by dot count. So if half a second has passed since the last loop iteration, then frame time will be a float value of 0.5 for half a second. Then set the current time equal to the new time, since we need to store the current time value for the next iteration of the while loop. Next, we could make the simple render systems render function take a time step value. But for now, it isn't really necessary. Instead, let's just delete these two lines from the simple render systems render function, since updating an object's position in a rendering system doesn't make much sense. Okay, the code should build and run, but now all we've got is a cube that doesn't move. So I'm going to create a new file called keyboardmovementcontroller.hpp. This class will be a simple example of how to get user input from the keyboard and use it to move game objects in real time. As usual, we start off by adding a header guard, so pragma once. And following that, include the LVE game object header and the LVE window header files. Then add your namespace and create a new class called keyboard movement controller. 
I'm leaving off the LVE prefix for this class and file name since I don't think this will stay as a core feature of the engine. Create a public struct called key mappings within the keyboard movement system class. This struct will store the relationship between different movement actions and the GLFW key codes. So for example, for the first member, I'll have int move left is equal to GLFW key A. This will bind the A key to the move left action. I've included the struct definition in a paste bin link below to save you all some time. This class will support 10 different actions for moving a game object. Translation up, down, left, right, forward, and back, as well as rotations to turn the object to its left or right and to look up or down. The key mappings have default values set, but these values can also be changed at runtime. Add a member variable with type key mappings called keys to store the movement controller's mapping initialized with the default values. I will also add two member variables of type float called move speed and turn speed. These will be used to adjust how quickly the controller will move and turn the game objects. I find 3 and 1.5 make good default values based on what we've got so far. Okay, now to add an update method, we have void move in plane xz. I call it this just to signal how exactly this movement function will work. This function will move a game object with the controls being relative to the direction the object is facing within the xz plane. Of course, there are many other possible ways to map user input to movement. This is just one method I personally find intuitive for controlling a first-person camera view. So the first argument is a glfw window pointer, followed by a float dt value for the time step, and finally an LVE game object reference as the target object by the controller. Just note this here means that there is a dependency on the keyboard movement controller to the glfw library. For this tutorial series, it doesn't really matter since I will only ever be using glfw, but if you plan on supporting other windowing systems, then you may want to create a more complete abstraction for user input devices that is not dependent on any specific windowing system. Okay, now let's create the implementation. First copy the move function signature, and then I'll add a new file called keyboard movement controller dot CPP. First include the keyboard movement controller header file, then add your namespace and paste in the move function signature. Then add your class's name scope before the function's name. Okay, so we'll start by creating a glm vec3 variable called rotate, initialized to zero. We will use this to store the user input for the rotation values. Next, we need to check which keys are currently pressed down. So in an if statement, call glfw get key, with the first argument being the window pointer, and the second argument being whatever key code is stored in the keys.lookWrite field. We can check if this value is equal to glfw underscore press, indicating that at the time, the glfw poll events function was last called, the look right key was currently pressed down. If this is true, we are going to take the rotate.y value and increment it by one. Then duplicate this if statement and update to check the key code for looks left, in which case rather than add one, we subtract. Next, duplicate both these lines and do the same for the look up and look down keys. where instead we add or subtract one to rotate.x. Now that we have this variable storing the current rotation inputs, we can add it to the game object's rotation transform value. So game object dot transform dot rotation plus equals look speed times dt times glm normalize rotate. We scale the rotation inputs by look speed and delta time so that the game object will update in a steady manner independent of whatever the current frame rate is. I normalize the rotate variable so that the game object doesn't rotate faster diagonally than when rotating solely in the vertical or horizontal directions. When no keys are pressed down, the rotate variable will stay as the zero vector. And if you try to normalize the zero vector, the whole equation blows up. So to fix this, we need to add a check to only update the game object's rotation when rotate is non-zero. 
the best way I know how to check this for a vector is use the dot product with itself and check the inequality against epsilon. The vector dot product with itself is equal to the sum of the squares of its components. So this will be a positive value equivalent to the square of the vector's length. And we can check using epsilon because it is always a good idea to avoid comparing a float value directly with zero. Next, I'm going to limit the range of the game object's transform.rotation.x value to be clamped between plus or minus 1.5. This roughly corresponds to 85-ish degrees. While not strictly necessary, I do this to prevent objects from being able to go upside down. Then for the game object.transform.rotation.y value, I'll set it to be itself mod 2 pi. 2 pi is 360 degrees, so a full turn, and this re prevents a repeated spinning in one direction, causing the value to overflow. Okay, next we need to handle the translation move actions. The move forward, backward, left, and right directions all move the game object parallel to the XZ plane. However, they depend on knowing which direction the game object is facing. So I will add a float yaw is equal to game object dot transform dot rotation dot y. Then we can declare the forward direction with const glm vec3 forward dir with the values sine of yaw, zero, and cos of yaw for the x, y, z components respectively. To calculate the right direction, we must find the perpendicular vector within the xz plane. So we will have const glm vec3 right dir with forward dir dot z comma zero comma negative forward dir dot x. And this will be the desired perpendicular vector. Finally, the up direction is simply const glm vec3 up dir with zero negative one and zero. Declare a glm vec3 move dir vector initialized with zero to store the user movement input. And then we'll use the same method as above to get the keyboard inputs. Update the key value to keys.moveForward and then set move dir to plus equals forward dir. Duplicate this line changing to keys.moveBackward and move dir to minus equals forward dir. And then it's just the same idea from the move left, right, up, and down actions. Just duplicate the lines, updating the key code being fetched, and update the move dir with plus or minus the right dir vectors for left and right movement, and uh, plus or minus the up dir vector for up and down movement. Then, for the same reasons mentioned before, copy and paste this if statement for the purposes of checking that the move dir vector is non-zero. So if we have if glm dot move dir comma move dir is greater than epsilon, then the game object dot transform dot translation plus equals move speed times delta time times glm normalize move dir. Okay, now this function relies on having the glfw window pointer, which we currently have no way of getting. So let's open up the LVE window header file and add a new getter function with return type glfw window pointer called get glfw window. Let's mark this function const and simply return the window member variable. Okay, now let's create an instance of the movement controller and apply it to the camera. Open your application implementation and include the keyboard movement controller header file. Now we currently do not store the camera's position or orientation in any way between frames. So I'm going to create a new game object within the run function using auto viewer object equal to LVE game object create game object. This game object has no model and will not be rendered, but is just used to store the camera's current state. Next, declare a keyboard movement controller called camera controller with an empty initialization. Then within our while loop, below where the new frame time is calculated, we add camera controller dot move in plane xz, 
with LVE window dot get glfw window as the first argument, followed by frame time, and then finally the viewer object. This will update the viewer object's transform component based on the keyboard input, proportional to the amount of time elapsed since the last frame. Finally, we need to update our camera object using the new state of the viewer object. We can do this with camera.setViewYXZ, passing viewer object.transform.translation for the first position parameter, and then viewer object.transform.rotation as the rotation parameter. Let's clean things up a bit by removing these unused function calls. And then if you build and run, you should now be able to control the location of the camera within the scene by using the WASD keys to move and the arrow keys to look around. And this should work the same regardless of which present mode you choose to use. If I go back into my swap chain to return to using present mode FIFO and run the application again, you can see that the camera moves at the same speed even though the frame rate is now significantly lower. One last thing is if you try to resize the window while you have a key pressed down, with the current implementation, the game loop pauses and when it resumes, the camera will move in one large jump based on how much time has elapsed. This can be undesirable for certain applications, in which case you could add a limit on the max allowable frame time. Okay, so we just barely scratched the surface on both the topics of user input and game loop timing. Based on the type of game you are creating, you may require different methods for controlling your game's camera and other objects. Feel free to experiment with different control methods and different forms of input. And a good exercise can be to open a 3D application that you are familiar with and see if you can then implement its form of camera control and user input within your engine. For example, within Blender, the mouse is used to control where the viewfinder is looking. And finally, for game loop timings, I strongly recommend reading the additional resources I provided. Anyway, thanks for watching and keep on coding. Cheers.